Today's, today's scripture is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, 22 to 31. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Aragopolis and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now, what you worship at some, as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should be, where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offsprings, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to re repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. That ends God's word for this morning. So in our scripture for this morning, we find Paul going into Athens to tell people about Jesus. Now, I'm sure that most of you have heard of Athens, Greece. You all probably know that at uh, one time, Athens was a very important city. It was the political seat of power for the mighty Greek empire. But by the time that Paul was there preaching, uh, it no longer held the same stature that it once had. Corinth was now the city of political importance in Greece, and all of Greece was also under Roman control. However, Athens still held some importance to the ancient world. It was still one of the great university cities. See, it was a city that was renowned for being a place of learning. So Paul walks into this great city of learning and he sees all the shrines that the people had made to all the different gods they worshipped. And it wasn't just the Greek mythology gods that you may be thinking of that had shrines. Paul finds uh, shrines to gods that people had brought with them from the places they have lived and visited. And so it's in this environment that Paul chooses to begin to tell people about Jesus and about God. Now, Athens was both an easy and difficult place at the same time for Paul to witness. It was easy because there were people that were willing to listen to what he had to say. They were interested in learning about the religions of other peoples and places. So much so that they had created an idol to stand in place for all the gods that they had never heard of. And Paul uses that to his advantage to set up his discussion about God. And while this allowed for an opening for Paul to witness, he still had a difficulty when, dif when witnessing in Athens. He was up against a lot of other religious ideas. Ones that had long been in place for the people of Athens. You see, the good is that they were willing to seek out God, but the weakness was that they had begun to accept 
all gods and idols that they came across as equal. And Paul lets them know that he wants to bring to them the one true God and lead them away from all others. We really do love to talk about those early Christians, don't we? The ones that were willing to go out and teach others about Jesus. The ones that were willing to risk their lives to help spread the gospel. The ones that were willing to give up everything they had and live with one another in order to further the kingdom of God. We love to tell those stories. However, what we don't like to do by and large is to live the way that they did. We struggle at times to witness to others. We struggle with the idea that if we speak up about our faith, others might see us differently or might treat us differently. There is no one in this world that likes to be rejected. If you think about a time in your life where you felt rejected by someone, I'm guessing that it might still be a painful memory for you. It is because of this fear of rejection that we do not witness to others when we have the chance to do so. It has become so ingrained in people today that many of us don't even consider how we would even start to witness to someone. We don't think about our own testimony and how it would sound if we were asked to give it. We think about how we're thankful to Jesus for what he's done for us. We praise God for all the good that he has done in our lives, but we often fail to think about how we would express those things to someone else. We have to begin to move past that fear of rejection. We need to be thinking about how we can give our testimony to those that need to hear it. After all, if we believe what we say we believe, then saving others is truly a matter of life and death. What I think we need to do is we need to make sure that we're getting ourselves to the point where we are always ready to give that testimony. We have to really sit down and think about how it is we would tell the story of what Jesus has done in our lives to others. Now, one of the things I say to the teams that I coach is that you need to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And I know that sounds a little bit weird, right? And you might be thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, we stay ready so we don't have to get ready. We do the work of preparation ahead of time so that we don't have to stumble through the getting ready part when it comes time for us to act. In baseball, we remind our players to get down and get ready for the ball before it's hit. We tell them that before the pitcher even lets go of the pitch. Get down and get ready. Oftentimes, when we look out to the field, they're still doing this. <laughs> and so we say it again, get down and get ready, and usually they, they are by then. But that way they don't waste time on motions of getting down and getting ready when the ball is actually hit. So I'll put it to you this, uh, this way for those of you that are not into baseball or sports. I'll tell you a story about getting ready. One of the great joys that I have in my life is that I get to take my youngest daughter, Brenna, uh, to school every day. We get to spend time together each morning, just the two of us. We watch cartoons, we eat our breakfast, and then we head out to school. And on a good day, where we've made sure that we know where everything is the night before, and we've made sure to get ready in advance, we have a wonderful morning together. However, there are mornings when we do not do the work prior to getting up that day. You know, maybe she wakes up a little bit grumpy, or maybe I wake up a little bit grumpy. And we can't find our shoes, and we can't find our backpack, and we forgot to get our water bottle ready, and it, where is it? Maybe it's still in the car from yesterday. We let our dogs out, and one of them jumps the fence, and we have to chase them around uh, before we can leave. When we have those types of mornings, we waste all this time that we could have spent watching cartoons and having fun on getting ready because we didn't stay ready. So I encourage you all to begin getting ready to give your testimony to people so that you don't have to worry about that when the time comes to give it. 
Now, I also think that we struggle sometimes with giving our testimony because we feel like it's not good enough. We feel like it's not grand enough to impress people. To go back to our writer of our scripture for today, Paul, when we think about his testimony, it is miraculous, right? Saul, a man dedicated to wiping Christians out, is visited by Jesus on the road to Damascus. He's struck blind by the encounter. He has to seek out Ananias, another follower of Jesus, to help him regain his sight. Because that's what Jesus tells him to do. And after this encounter, he dedicates his life to helping others come to know Jesus. What a testimony, right? How can we ever compete with something like that? Well, for most of us, we, can't, we just can't. Our testimony will most likely be less dramatic than Paul's. However, ours is no less important. You see, the same Jesus that came to Paul is the same Jesus that came to you. The same God that wanted to save Paul is the same God that wanted to save you. When we stop thinking that we have to have this grand story to tell, we can see how important our own testimony can be. You need to consider this as well. When you give your testimony to people, you are talking to people that know you. They don't know Paul. Oh, they might have heard of Paul, but they don't know Paul the way they know you. So maybe your simple story is what they need in order to begin to believe in Jesus. Now this morning, I want to just briefly, briefly give you my own testimony. I was blessed to be raised in a family of believers. At the age of eight, I decided that I wanted to be baptized at the same time my parents were being baptized into our church. I felt that Jesus was calling my life at that time to follow him. The tradition of the church that I grew up in was slightly different than the Methodist church. And most people are baptized in that church as an act of joining the church or when they reach an age where they can make the decision for themselves. From that day forward, I have always felt a comfort in my life. I have felt Jesus walk beside me in my darkest moments and I have felt him walk beside me in the most wonderful moments. His presence goes before me and after me, no matter what I may face. Right now in my life, I have felt how he's helping me to deal with all the things that I'm trying to juggle. Being a pastor, going to school, raising children, being a husband, and being a son. My everyday life is pretty crazy. But I know that I have that rock of salvation that I can always lean upon. I am thankful for all that he has done for me and all that I know he will do for me. Now, when we listen to that as a testimony, it's not an overly compelling story, is it? It's certainly no blinding on the way to Damascus. But what my testimony is, it is honest. It is true. It is what I have felt and what I am feeling now. It might not be the greatest conversion story, but it is my story right now. It may not move the masses when they hear it, but it might move one person. One person might hear it and think, you know what? My life is crazy too. I can't seem to find peace among all the things that are going on. Maybe, just maybe, I should look into what's going on in Eric's life. Maybe I should talk to him a little bit more about Jesus. See, that is what our testimonies should be. They should be honest. They should tell the story of how we came to Jesus and what we have experienced since then. So tell your stories to others and let Jesus do the rest. Make sure you're staying ready after you've gotten ready so you don't miss the chance to tell others about how Jesus can change their lives. My challenge for you this week is this. I want you to practice giving your testimony to one person. And it could just be someone that's sitting right next to you every day, just to practice telling it. 
so that you're ready when the time comes. Amen.